Quest University uh, is a university that's situated. Okay. So uh, it's situated in Squamish, which is halfway between Whistler and Vancouver in BC. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, where is it? What is it? What were the challenges? What were the gifts? What were my strategies? The applicability of my strategies in relation to being here in the U of R. And uh, again, uh, my, my big takeaways in terms of as a researcher, teacher. Um, you probably know that I'm very interested in curriculum design and the phenomena of teaching and learning, not just uh, carrying out my classes and uh, doing research. So I was really interested in going to an alternative university to see how they were operating. So uh, it has borrowed its model from an American university. It is considered an alternative uh, university. I would imagine, now that I've been here, I know this, that it's students who um, probably would only survive anyway for the first few years of a university in a context like this. Um, so it is taking a lot of students who come out of alternative high schools and cap catching them and holding them in a really beautiful way, but a really intense way. So uh, Quest University, so now, uh, would you mind toggling over to that? Uh, and I'll just show you a little tiny video of it. This is the campus, it's not huge. Um, about 800 students, hi. Uh, the one that's just this one, good, and is there sound? So instead of me talking it, this might be more interesting to you. You're following some of the images and the quotes, which I guess will be good enough at this point. Um, I filled out 13 college applications in high school. I, this is the one for me. Um, you can move that little bar down so we can read the quotes, maybe. What like bar? The, oh, <laughs> or get rid of it. It's there permanently. It's not on my. So that, <laughs> all right, so I, I will talk a little bit to it. There's about uh, one third American students, one third international, one third local Canadian. Um, there's uh, approximately 800 students. It's it nestled in, a, in an incredibly beautiful location, as you can see. It's uh, nestled in um, between mountains. Um, the students, it's a humanities and science combined, so it's interdisciplinary. The students come out with a, um, a degree that could be sciences or arts, but they follow one question, hence the name of the university quest. So they develop in their first year what that question may be. Um, so uh, we can go uh, over to the block system, so I can show that. So this is what the block system looks like there. Every um, term is a block. It's three and a half weeks long. And they only take one course in that three and a half weeks. And you teach either in the morning, nine to 12, or in the afternoon, one to four. And it's assumed that the students are working on your course for the rest of the days. And so this is a hugely intense and beautiful situation where I'm holding a group of 18 students fully for three and a half weeks and, and longer because of course I sent readings prior and assignments were due slightly after. So holding is a really important word there. So now I can go back to my um, slideshow. So uh, I went up there and, thanks Shana, I went up there and talked to them before I did the um, application for artist in residence. 
and I had a tour and students had lunch with me and I met with faculty and I found out some of the questions like a student they were really operating like graduate students like a student might say I'm interested in the relationship between peace initiatives and arms creation in particular countries another student might say I'm interested in creativity so some of them were like huge arcing questions where it was like, mm, and then others were like really specific bandwidth. And <clears throat> they're assigned one faculty member who is mentoring them. So the faculty members are like <laughs> exhausted because they're operating like a graduate program in many ways. And because they're operating like a graduate program, the students operate like graduate students in a way. They have a highly, highly defined critical criticality, um, discipline for reading and thinking and talking, and very, very low level of emotional intelligence and communication skills. So it's this kind of weird spectrum with the students um, where they're very high level in one area and very low level in another area. And so either of those polar extremes are is hugely intense for a faculty member. Um, so uh, here is where I taught mostly, right in this area. Um, and then there's beautiful residences. You stay on in residence. You eat with, you know, it's, it's full on. It's like Banff, right? But it's a, a university. So uh, the artist in residency, which you might be interested in as working as a teacher and an artist, is uh, you apply for it. Um, it's one week of just artist in residence, one week of, or three and a half weeks of teaching, and one week again of artist in residence. Sometimes um, they go two weeks and then they teach the course, or they teach the course and then they do two weeks. Because I'm here, I had to really strategically schedule it. So there was only one week that I could do, and that was our reading break. And there was only one week that I could do, which is when our courses were done. And in the three and a half weeks where my students were in pre-intern, I could teach the course. Uh, now, that meant I was teaching two courses, because I was online with uh, students throughout that three and a half weeks, as we often are in consultation while they're away. Um, so I would teach the course from 9 to 12, and thank goodness I had the foresight to have a boundary to say from 12 to 1, my office door is closed, because I had to, like, I had to really, like, relax, I had to eat, I had to think, I had to, like, calm down, because those three hours were um, holding the room in a, in a very, very challenging way. And then from 1 to 4.35, my office door was open, and it was a steady stream of students, steady. And then from 5 to 6, I swam. So these are the two areas bookending my teaching and consultations that kind of kept me sane. So um, my artist in residency in number one, look who's there. I'm going to have to toggle over to word, those word, the word and, and other. Did you have to get this up? Thanks, Sean, for helping. So there's Patrick and Karen and Joseph. And so that first week, I just invited a lot of friends who I've been working with and researching with to come up for the day. So uh, Patrick and Joseph and Karen actually came up for two days, and we worked quite a bit with some of the work we're doing around archetypes and um, indigenous, uh, indigenous stories and archetypes and dance. I'll just show a few of these pictures and then we'll go over there. So there we are in the dance studio working this out. It was really fantastic. Then I brought up a dance artist, Donna Redlick, who also is working with me around somatic practices and archetypes, working off of Dixit cards and tarot cards and movement and story. And in that week, we had an open door for the stu students to come and go, which was really fantastic because we found out more about our research and our practice by interfacing with students who would sometimes just sit on the side and observe and ask questions and sometimes would get up and work with us. So it was, uh, as we 
we know teaching is modeling, and it was a wonderful way to just model practice and uh, with the, the students. And then I taught after that, like the three weeks after, so it was fabulous to have some of those students in my class. Carol Sawyer is an opera singer and a visual artist in Vancouver, and the both of us are working uh, with story, movement, and voice. And so she came up. And then Scott Morgan, who is law skill, uh, is doing soundscapes and visuals, who's also working with me on my piece, Landing with the Remington character. So every day was packed with these fantastic uh, workshops in the studio where students would come and go. So we could go to the, I think it's the Word document, um, that just gives a little bit of, so this is sort of what the, um, what it looked like from Monday to Friday. The first one was arch archetypes and narratives, the second the sensing body, the third landscapes of sound, and the last one was searching for authentic movement in performance. Um, I know that some of the students who came and participated in these, it shifted and influenced their question, which I, I think is just, I feel really honored that I was part of that process in some way. Um, so we could go to the uh, Adobe uh, Acrobat uh, PDF. Uh, and this is a little bit, um, it's a syllabus that I've been working with here too in the summer intensives. Um, the Power and Politic of Objects Through Stories and Art Making. Um, and you can just scroll through so I can show that there's um, basically what we were doing was, this is my uh, four weeks, it was three and a half weeks, and I laid out what I was working on with the students in terms of um, developing methods around storytelling, movement, objects, um, working in a huge range of contexts. I had scientists, I had people from nursing, I had people from social work, I had people from sciences, um, all in the same class. So because it was interdisciplinary, I had to take a core of what I would normally teach here and figure out how I could keep it porous enough that they could meet that core with their own particular question. So the assignments were, were a clear framework, but how they actually realized those assignments were wildly different. So this is where I started to really learn, uh, like I've really stretched my muscles in curriculum design in this situation. So we could go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and I'll just stay there now, from now on. Uh, so the classes are uh, small rooms. They're kind of like our graduate boardroom downstairs, maybe a little bit bigger. Big round table, 18 capped in the students. So I had like 36 wait lists. And in the first uh, few, uh, first week, um, students were coming and going. There was all kinds of shifting. And then finally, it kind of settled by uh, Wednesday or Thursday. Because uh, I, by that point, we had covered a lot of curriculum. Um, with that, I received, I'll come back to that one. That's where I lived. <laughs> that was my office. Pretty beautiful, mm -hmm. really. Like, it really made me realize, and I, I think Regina is absolutely stunning too, but it made me realize how important beauty is in terms of teaching and learning. Um, so the first day I got a couple of accommodation letters, the next day I got a couple more. By the end of the week I, I could say that it was almost every student that came with accommodation letters. So I started at first looking at them and meeting with them and mm, and then at a certain point I just went, you know what, this is humanity. Like, this isn't accommodation, this is humanity. And I, I actually said it, like, out loud in the class. I said, um, I'm holding the room, and this is the room. This is the composite of the room. That's not called accommodation. That's just called teaching. <laughs> and so we will work together, and you will ask me if there are things that will help support you in your optimal performance in this class, your optimal learning in this class. So that meant, whoa, whoa, every time there was an assignment. Could we, could I, what about, should, they, they came with masses of um, alternatives for my assignments. And it was fantastic because it drove me down to the core of my assignment to listen to how they were 
um, modifying it and for me to say, yes, you will still get what the purpose of this assignment is if you do this. Or no, because this is like this. Can you, and we would negotiate. I remember at about week two, uh, maybe even week three, there was a student that said, can we do this? And they were so used to me saying, yes, if, yes, yes. And finally I said, no. And they, they got really shocked. And I said, no, because that feels uncomfortable for you, right? You need to be uncomfortable. You're going to get assignments in your work situation. You're going to get projects. You're going to get directives that feel uncomfortable for you. And it wouldn't be me respecting and honoring my position if I didn't work those muscles in you. So they were kind of shocked when I said no, but then they heard the rationale, and I needed to always give the rationale. Transparency was absolutely paramount in this situation. And that was the way that I could build trust with them. There were people that needed to leave the room and wash their hands many times in the class. There were people that needed to um, go to the back and shake their hands. There was all kinds of different ways that people were um, able to be in the room, even if they were out of the room, in the courts, even if they were out of the room at points. So it really pushed my notion of what is participation, because often we'll grade on participation. So look at the residents. Okay, I've done that. <laughs> I mean, we're talking beauty, 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 like going up the Sea to Sky Highway from Vancouver on a bus to Squamish was just delicious every time I did it. So one of the first things that we did was um, we uh, shifted the furniture in the room. So the room actually was ours for three and a half weeks. So we moved the tables aside, we stacked the chairs, we sat on the floor, we projected on the ceiling or on the wall instead of the screen. We just actually were very disruptive with the space because I honestly feel that furniture is one of the biggest problems in our learning uh, contexts and our learning processes. So um, I, I made sure that we were very nimble with the hardware in the class and just kept shifting it. So uh, being heard. They needed to be heard. I had lists of things that I wanted to do in a given three hours. And holy mackerel, those lists changed every class because somebody needed to be heard, or many of them needed to be heard. And then I needed to play pool with them, or I needed to, you know, it, was, it wasn't a situation that was traditional where we had boundaries between um, the, the professional practice of teaching and then off to my office where I didn't have anything else to do with the students. There were, um, those boundaries were blurred and I was able to continue to find a professionalism within uh, a certain kind of familiarity and camaraderie with the students, which I felt was um, unique and really important. I didn't play pool a lot, but I mean, that was just a symbol. <laughs> I didn't have time. Okay, so here's the most important thing about what I learned, distillation and momentum. So when we teach courses here, even with that syllabus that I teach um, here in the summer courses, it's, uh, it's uh, three, uh, no, sometimes I teach 10 days in a summer course, but it's eight hours a day. And they do the readings prior, and they can finish the assignments later. But it's, it's a little bit different because there isn't really distillation in those 10-day courses that I teach here. So I have to design my curriculum so it has a certain kind of momentum that doesn't feel like we're gapping out because a student has read something, they need to think about it, they need to reflect it the next week in the seminar, they've processed it in a certain way. So I had to find readings that could work in a fast processing. I had to find assignments that could be done in a way that was there was deep learning in a quick process. That's the course here in the summer. Here, I had the option, three and a half weeks. I could say something had to be done tomorrow and something had to be done, could be done in three weeks. So I could make choices of what 
warranted distillation and what was not, uh, what could uh, work with the momentum of the dailiness of that class. That's a really interesting kind of valuing of your assignments and your lectures to figure out what can land quickly, what needs to float in and kind of, you know, recursively make sense by turning it over and over again. Ah, that's the image for that. <laughs> Momentum. <laughs> Distillation. So, um, I, uh, these are some of my strategies in how to do this. Distillation and momentum uh, di came up to a different kind of curriculum mapping, and you're going to see what that looks like. Um, design thinking and appreciative inquiry were, would be my two approaches to working in this kind of context. And student-driven learning was critical in this situation. These students have been disempowered, disenfranchised, and this is a place where they're trying to reverse that. And so in that process, I needed to um, make sure that they felt that they were driving their learning process. So design thinking has these, uh, this kind of framework to encompass, to discover, to interpret, to ideate, to experiment, and then to evolve. And so in all of those situations, in all of those uh, concepts, I felt like uh, it was a different, even though some of those I touch on here, it was a different way of approaching myself as a teacher. It was like I had a, a fixed and a living curriculum that I was balancing. An appreciative inquiry, uh, valuing, prizing, esteeming, and honoring what was in the room, and then uh, to continue to work with the notion of discovery, search, systematic exploration, and study. So I work a lot with graphic notation, and I work a lot in the ways that I plan, in the ways I push or pull information, and the ways in which I reflect. So you'll see in a moment how I plan with graphic notation. When I push, it means that I'm giving assignment clarifications or I'm helping the students to figure out a synergy between my methods and the, that night's readings, and I do that through graphics. If I want um, to facilitate a group discussion on an assignment that they're going to have, I would pull information from them and I would notate it, and then they would take a picture of it, and then that would be their kind of map in terms of terms of engagement or um, topic themes uh, for a group assignment. And then graffiti, um, I always have students reflect on the entire course here and there, uh, and I often will do that through image. So we're gonna see some examples. So in my office, I had I was like, I kind of just dreamed this on the fly of the moment. Like after the first day, I went, holy mackerel. Like what I had planned in that little syllabus where you saw neatly four weeks and what I was going to do is not going to happen. <laughs> and yet I still need to cover my syllabus. How am I going to do that? So I put a big sheet of paper, and that's about the real size of it, for each week. And then what I did, these are when they're finished. I'm going to show you there. This is when they're in process. So week three is still in process. So every week, um, day one, two, three, four, and five, on that week, I put up post-it notes of my good, good intentions of what I plan to teach. And then in that 12 to one slot, when I said I, I had my door closed, I take out my felt pens and I do graphic notation of everything that we did do and then I would take the post-it notes off and throw them in the garbage, yay, or they would move down to the next day, or they'd move down to the parking lot. And so uh, if you saw the week one, two, three, and four on the first week, it was all post-it notes, all of them. And so I suspect that the students came to visit me often because they also wanted to see this. They wanted to see, they knew on the syllabus that nice clean mapping, but they liked this. They liked seeing that this was their experience on week two on Monday. This is what we did. You're right. And it, it was like reaffirming and then also preparing them for the next classes. So for me, it really made it tangible and kind of fun 
because as I was coloring things in and doing, you know, I was reflecting and processing as well. But it made it really tangible for me what mattered, what didn't, what goes in the garbage can, what goes in the parking lot. And so I, I came back here to teach a course in the summer and I did the same thing. And I had it down in the drama lab where I was lucky enough to have it uh, for the full 10 days. Nobody else was in there so I could keep them up. And students would come early and stand in front of them and take a look and think about what they were going to do. I was pretty text oriented on the first one, but then I started getting a little bit more imagistic, which was nice. So we'll come back to that later because on the last class I took that down into the classroom and they did their own graphic notation on the process of the um, three and a half weeks. So they came late, you know. <laughs> Some of them would wander in ten minutes in, you know, picking their teeth with a bagel in their hand. Others would come half an hour late. They didn't care. And you know, I was like, what? <laughs> And so I thought, how, how am I going to do this? I can't point to them and say, I do not accept this. You must be here on time. I will come at 8.30, but uh, that's not good enough. That modeling isn't good enough. So how am I going to get them into class? What brings them into the room, both in body and in presence? Some of them did show up right at 9, but they weren't there. They were so. Uh, this does have sound. Uh, the first way that I understood about making a difference in uh, getting people into the room. This is a lecture hall that I was lecturing in at Simon Fraser University. This is students coming to that lecture hall. There's the lecture hall. This is them coming. Looks pretty much the same, right? Coming to the class, I was teaching one of the worst classes possible. They had to take it. They didn't want to take it. So I had to draw them into the room. I had to create the bonfire. So what I did was I started to make a cold wall. Ah, oh, there it is. Oh, I've got sound there. Uh, no, it's too loud. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to figure out provocative images or activities that would get the students ready and get them stimulated so that I could just slip in what I needed to slip in. I also uh, show this slideshow to uh, doctoral students who are about to time out. It's a course that I teach. <laughs> okay, and then this one uh, was uh, an assignment they had called Writing the City. I wanted them to look at the tensions of uh, nature and city and to begin to create two word poems with an image 
around the tension of place. First, take pictures of objects in place that surprise you. Then add a two-word poem, resolving differences. Stand tall. Support matters. So they uh, had an assignment to do this, and then we put these images all over campus. It was called the Unexpected Exhibition. So this might be one also where I say, look at these three levels and tell me what is in common and what is different. What kind of story comes from these three different conglomerates? And this begins their uh, process of looking at artifacts and objects and the narratives that are living within objects and artifacts. I might have an image that uh, is an elicitation of what does, uh, let's write about teaching and learning from that image. Then another thing, I'm going to, should I stop like at quarter to? Is that what you want or ten to? I'm just it, wanting to piece. It's 12.36, so yeah, if you have 15 minutes or 10 minutes for discussion. Okay, yeah, I'll, t I'll take about another five, seven minutes. Here. So the integrated warm-up, remember I showed you that building that had a hole in the middle? Um, and that's where I taught. It's in the academic building, and it is like a donut. Um, and inside is land, beautiful land, spiral staircase and all that. And so um, on our first day, I taught them a warm up in a really big space. And then for the rest of the time, we were in that little boardroom where we shoved furniture and things, but it still wasn't really big enough for a warm up. And I said, I've got an idea. And I said, let's go out in the hall. And I said, there's 18 of us, let's be um, equal distant apart and go all the way around the donut. So it meant that I could only see a person to my left and a person to my right. And I had to have faith that the whole class did what I asked them to do. And then I started the warm-up that they had learned. And that person and that person were following me, and that person was following that person. And that, and that, and that. It was an experiment I'd never done before. And we, we started to do it almost every class. And other classes would come out and join us because it was a bonfire. We were mm -hmm. making a bonfire. Mm -hmm. Um, the first day when we did it, we ran back into class. People were just so exhilarated. What? That's fantastic. And I said, let's talk about lateral governance. Let's talk. You know, I took it right away to politics. And it was so interesting. They thought it was fun, but actually it was really informative. Because I surrendered my leadership, and we created a lateral leadership. And um, how might that work in the world? How might that work with your question, what you're doing? So those are examples of how I was able to bridge artful practices into all of the disciplines. Um, everybody holding a stick, facing each other, and having to lower it at the same time without talking, and creating a deep listening to impulse rather than a leading of impulse, and talking about um, what Ferrari calls conversations are only waiting for your time to speak. Um, target and arrow, one person is the tar uh, target, the other person is the arrow. This is the arrow, this is the target. And one person just creates the target and the other person has to hit the hand. And they get really tired and really worked up and then I give them a piece of paper that talks about goal setting and targets that are missed and targets that are identified and achieved. So those are the kinds of warm-ups that I would do that uh, would transfer embodied knowledge into their own work. Then I also did something that I thought was hugely successful, and I want to do it here, it's called reading provocations. They loved reading, and they read three texts, big ones, in three and a half weeks. And then what I did was I separated the students into five different groups. One group would have a discipline, and each group would have a discipline. They would have to take um, five, seven minutes to create the essential learnings from that text through that medium. So we didn't do it every class, but we did it five classes out of the uh, 18 classes. And so this group that interpreted the reading in dance, next time would interpret it in theater, next time would interpret it in visual arts. So they all had a chance to transmediate their learnings from a text into a discipline. And so in one of those five days, 
uh, we would see five different renderings of the text. They loved this. And they were getting longer and longer. And so I was like, can I teach? Because they were just like running with it. Um, and it was a, a wonderful way to uh, find out what mattered in what they were reading. And then to be able to have a conversation afterwards to reflect on maybe some of the areas that I thought were important that maybe hadn't been touched on in these renderings. Here's an example. <laughs> This is a visual artful pro provocation. The group decided to make a mobile with uh, condoms and dinosaurs suspended inside. You never knew what these students were going to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was about uh, uh, these students getting angry with sort of like old white man t oriented texts, that they were feeling that t the texts were very biased, or this particular text was very biased and narrow. Um, so we lived with that mobile for three and a half weeks. Um, I got them to do a Pecha Kucha, which is 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide, around their question. And this was stunning for me. I just, I thought these were the most amazing portraits because I gave them a chance to fit what, what really pumped their heart into a framework of an assignment. And they rose to the challenge. They were unbelievable. And so part of our exhibition at the end was uh, these self-portraits. And on either side of this wall were windows out to the mountains. So I just sat there going, <laughs> Life doesn't get better than this. Students who are honest and beautiful and putting work into something and then we seeing the mountains. Like, like, I just thought that was so cool. And then uh, it culminated into uh, exhibitions. And uh, this is the two word uh, poems that I had assigned. I'm going through this pretty fast now. So they were trying to figure out how to create tension, a synergy between object and uh, poetics. Some were more successful than others. sensorial uh, um, approaches to objects and narrative with winter grasses, tin drum, and, um, different different influences of onions. And Kathy, whilst you're going through that, how did the, what were the qualifications that these kids had to enter the university? Like, how were they evaluated evaluated to evaluate to um, to be able to enter in? Yeah. Um, I, that's a really good question because um, it's a private university. Uh -huh. So they're, you know, private universities are struggling for enrollment. So I imagine that um, if they've had a grade 12, um, if they've graduated from grade 12, they would probably be able to get in because it's not a cheap university. If they came with that, with the, um, whatever, the enrollment money, then they would pop the tuition, they'd probably be able to get in. They're very strict though around attendance and things like that. This was body mapping. This is now showing just examples of the exhibition. Objects, stories, uh, tableaus from a dollar store that indicated their favorite place, sound room. They actually made the exhibition. <laughs> So it was everything we had done in class. It, they were so, so proud. And 
you know, the day before they put it on their Facebook page and tons of people, like, I said, okay, let's make a poster, you know, weeks in advance, and then the day before on Facebook page and everybody came. <laughs> so they, uh, they really enjoyed it. And then uh, the last thing is their, um, their graphic uh, reflection <coughs> of the course, which was both done on banner collectively. I put on loud music, I, I put out felt pens, and then they don't talk, and they take turns, and they stand back, and they watch, and then that will trigger something. They go forward, and it just goes for about half an hour while they populate it. And then they did their own. And then we did a gallery walk on that. integrated body warm-ups, exhibitions and assignments, um, accommodations and differentiated teaching, transparent responsive curriculum mapping, and modeling discipline and depth of inquiry. Um, the takeaway uh, for me, <laughs> the second uh, residency, I went into uh, other instructors' classes and did workshops. One was on myths and monsters. Um, the other was on uh, dialogue between musicians and dancers. Um, I held a lot of workshops in the studio and did a lot of consultations with students around their questions. And that's it. <laughs> so I really feel like, you know, like um, Dr. Seuss, I grew 10 sizes. <laughs> when I went there and I really would uh, recommend it. It took two years to get the application accepted, but uh, I would really recommend it. <laughs>